There you are. Excellent. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for making it out. Really looking forward to this Meet BSD. I don't know if this is my third, fourth. It's been a number of years now. So it's exciting to be back. This is a great location. I'm enjoying this. This is an awesome place to hold this. So um, it's first thing in the morning, first talk. Hooray, what's more exciting than talking about a lot of JSON and looking at JSON all morning? I mean, I know that's what wakes me up in the morning. So, and if you find enjoyment in that, there's something wrong with you and see me afterwards. <laughs> so, but we're gonna be talking today about building your own free BSD based release with TrueOS and some of the horrible, horrible things we've done to integrate JSON into the build, touch some make files, mix packages in there, etc. So it's gonna be a lot of fun, bear with me. If looking at JSON bores you a little bit, I'm sorry, come talk to me afterwards and I'll get you excited again. So first of all, why am I even talking about this? Why are we messing with a build system again? Well, I've been going to BSD events now for 10 plus years, and one of the things I've found talking to everyone is everyone has their own build system for every project, every company. It seems like, I mean, he, heck, at IX Systems, I mean, one company, I think we have three, maybe four separate build systems to do exactly the same thing. At the end of the day, they're running a build world, they're running a build kernel, they make some packages, they create an image, they shove that image somewhere and put the packages somewhere, and we have one written in Python and in Shell, a couple in Shell. I don't know, JT, if any of your guys' has Qt in it. God, I hope not. But anyway, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. And at the end of the day, I mean, really, we're all trying to solve the same problem here, is we just want to get a build and put that build somewhere and provide it to our customers or end users, or heck, our IT department even has one too. So. Um, one thing we didn't want is when we were talking about build systems, in particular the reason this came up was FreeNAS recently. We're looking ahead to the future for 12 and nobody in the dev team likes the current build system. So we're like, great, we're going to write a fifth now. This is wonderful. So we had some things that you know, I looked at and said, we just don't want another external one which lives outside the source tree and it's this weird monstrosity that somebody has to maintain and inevitably it falls to the least lucky guy on the team. So we wanted to have something a little more built in. But we also were like, well, if we're going to do a build system again, why don't we do something that's a little more abstract that we could use amongst all the different IX projects. We have a couple different uh, customer facing projects we're working on. IT, of course, has their own. And then we have a bunch of uh, folks within IX systems who work on things like GhostBSD or Triton, or I'm working on a TrueOS version that's KDE 5. And I'm like, it would be great if we could all kind of just share the same builder. And you know, we're all tired of rewriting the same builders for new projects. It's just, it takes a lot of the fun out of spinning up a new project or distribution, if you will, if you have to go and write all those build scripts manually. So what's recently changed and what was more interesting for me was package base. I mean, it's really a game changer when we started looking at this process. So like, okay, we got some new stuff coming from FreeBSD. It allows us to use basically one complete set of tools to do build, deployment, and build a complete FreeBSD based image relatively easily. It opened up some interesting new doors between uh, base ports and then uh, the port tree, which we're gonna go over and maybe you guys will say sacrilege, he did some horrible things, but we think it's kind of cool. And then it got, got us thinking, well, if we're already building one set of packages, why can't that all be combined into one process? So at the end of the day, I have a set of kernel packages, but also I get Firefox or I get Python or Django or whatever it is I need for my particular project. So what we're going to cover today is we're going to actually spend part of the morning looking at some JSON, a manifest that we uh, use to control our entire build process. We're going to go through some of the base changes we put into FreeBSD to incorporate this. Um, continuous integration, we use a lot of Jenkins. We're going to talk about that a little bit because we felt like that should be something we consider up front. How we can try and slim the base down because we found most of our builders, they end up cutting things out of base after they build. So that's cool. And then kind of what we still want to do. So, first of all, TrueOS, if you haven't run it recently, it's no longer really focused on desktop. It's more of a building platform for other desktops and other systems. So again, GhostBSD is based on it. We are working on a build of FreeNAS based on it, which I just got done a couple weeks ago. It works, which is kind of cool. Um, Project Trident, which is a Illumina-based desktop, is built on this as well. And, um, they all are able to do this with a single JSON manifest file. 
this JSON manifest file can cover a variety of different things, but it includes options for your world environment, your kernel flags, port settings, ISO settings, and more, which we'll cover here in a moment. But what's really cool is it makes the process of going from, hey, I have an idea, to, hey, I have an image you can go try, very, very quickly now, because you literally just have to go edit one little JSON file, or bigger JSON file, depending on how big your project is, run a couple build commands, and you're done. You have an ISO and packages ready to push. And the best part was I really wanted it to fit within the traditional FreeBSD process. I didn't want to have to teach my devs or other people in the company how to go run yet another build system and oh, here's the magic environment you need and flags and, and commands to download. So we wanted it just to look more or less like FreeBSD does right now. So first up, you may ask, why did you do it in JSON? I'm a big UCL fan. Alan, where are you? I know, right? <laughs> JSON's pretty standard. Uh, we use it for everything for our APIs for FreeNAS. That's what we're doing all day at IX. So I was like, okay, I'm comfortable here. But really the key was this JQ command. If you've not run that in the ports tree, it's a fantastic C little binary, which lets you do all kinds of JSON manipulation. You can embed it in a make file, shell scripts, and so forth. UCL doesn't have that. Now I know what you're saying, well, you can convert UCL to JSON, so yeah, sure. If somebody really, really wanted to make the case, I don't want it in JSON because I want UCL, we could add a converter and do the parsing that way. So see me after if you really want to die on that hill and need that for some reason. So what we've done is we've added an environment variable when you run your traditional build world called TrueOS Manifest. You set this at build time. If it's not set, there's a default one we ship in TrueOS. It's under release and there's a TrueOS-Manifest.json. That inc includes a default setup that's used by our continuous integration. That's our Jenkins tests. But with this single file, or if we make a new one and start making changes, we can radically alter the destiny of the things that are going to get built, the packages and the ISO. So let's just take a step in here and see what we got. So for base packages, yes, we've done some fun things here. So I don't know, is this a laser pointer? Hey, maybe you can see that. Okay, so name prefix. So how many of you guys are using package base right now or have used it? A couple? Oh, come on guys, you, you get with the times. Brad's working hard on this. We want to get this in. So uh, by default, package base calls everything FreeBSD dash something, runtime, runtime development, send mail. There's like 300 plus of these packages. Well, we wanted the ability to rename them. So we can now call them TrueOS or we call them FreeNAS. So when the user, if for whatever reason, they look at the package system, they'll see FreeNAS kernel, FreeNAS runtime, TrueOS kernel, TrueOS runtime. Eh, relatively minor change. This is where it gets a little more interesting, is because we're doing packages for the base system now, it's possible to inject dependencies in them. So what we have here is a new depend system, which we can uh, uh, list out in the JSON here. So for example, the runtime package, it's possible for me to now go through and say, you know what, my runtime is great, but I need things from the ports tree to really make this a proper runtime because I've added some new things. So UCL command, good example. Um, I can now inject that directly into the runtime during build process. And then you know, I can add additional ones as well. So maybe for development, you know, we use LLVM 7.0 and I just want to make sure when somebody package adds FreeBSD-Runtime Development, LLVM 7.0 comes in as a dependency. That's how you're going to represent it in the JSON. And feel free to interrupt with questions. This is an unconference, so I'm cool with that and uh, we'll take them as they come. Okay, continuing on for the base settings. So world flags. So sometimes you do want to pass special flags to when you're building world. Well, we can go ahead and list those in the JSON manifest now. So it's possible to build a nice list of, hey, I don't want send mail, I don't want port snap. You know, take your pick. I know for FreeNAS, I think we got like 30 of these set. So you can build a long list and have these all in your one JSON file and that'll get passed along to your build world process without having to remember to inject those externally or put them on the command line during the build. Okay, now this is where we're gonna take a moment and look at something special. So we've added conditionals to JSON. This was actually something we really wanted for FreeNAS because as most of you probably know, we have FreeNAS and we have TrueNAS. TrueNAS is a superset of FreeNAS in some ways. It takes FreeNAS, but then we add some additional things onto it. We even cut a few things off. But uh, that's what determines the difference between the two. And we're like, would it be really cool to have one manifest and then have some conditionals where we can say, depending on an environment variable being set, we're either a FreeNAS or a TrueNAS box. So we're able to do that with JSON pretty darn easily. So if we build with TrueNAS set, we're now able to supply additional arguments and you can add or layer as many of these on as you want. 
So if you have a whole bunch of conditionals because you're building a product that maybe has different flavors or varieties, it's very possible to represent this in one file now. Um, ditto with kernel. You know, again, we build different, uh, different settings for free NAS and true NAS. Kernel may have some different flags on and off, so it's really nice to be able to represent that in one JSON manifest. And you'll notice this is, this is all in one file right now. So again, we've kept this pretty easy. So, okay, that's neat, base, yeah, that's, that's cool. We built base, we set some flags, but let's take a look at the port stream. So, TrueOS, FreeBSD, or uh, excuse me, TrueOS, FreeNAS, we do everything in Git. So we wanted to put some Git stuff in here too, but we still have some love for you subversion diehards out there. So for the port stream, um, in the JSON manifest, it's possible because now we're interjecting dependencies from the port tree, and we have to give it a port tree so it knows what to fetch and build. So by default, we're going to go ahead and list what type of port tree, where are we fetching it from. It could be Git, it could be Subversion, I added tarball support, I don't remember who asked for that, but I did. And then null, which is nullfs, so maybe you've already got it locally checked out and you don't want to go and fetch it. Maybe you mangle it or run some other scripts beforehand, that's fine. And then the URL is going to be, of course, uh, where we fetch it from. It could be a Git, it could be a Subversion location, that's your tar file or directory. Branches for Git and Subversion. And then we get into the fun stuff. Everybody, when they build ports, it seems like has different flags for that too. Free NAS, I think I counted 50 or 60 different flags we set on a variety of different ports, you know, changing defaults. A lot of examples are we get rid of docs or we get rid of example files or turn features on in Samba that maybe default FreeBSD doesn't use. So we're able to go ahead and provide a make.conf uh, uh, schema here and we're able to say here's our default settings, but with TrueNAS maybe we have a different set of uh, settings we want to pass along. Okay, here. And of course the conditional with only if true is set and then adding new ones is easy. If you've ever done JSON before, you're just adding new lines. The syntax is very straightforward. It's clean. I like that. Okay, this is where it gets fun. So building all. So when we build TrueOS, we build Project Trident or Ghost BSD. Most of our users want the whole port stream. So we have an option to say, actually, I want everything. So you can toggle that true or false if you want to build the whole port tree. But in some cases, maybe you only want to build a subset. Free NAS, we only care about 350-ish uh, ports to be built. So we'll go ahead and list those out here and say these are the critical ones for us to build a free NAS image. Um, if build all is set to true and you do still list a, a set of packages, we actually treat that as an essentials list. So where that's important is we do everything in Jenkins and with CI to build all of our TrueOS jobs. They're all done on schedules. We do snapshots every six hours. We do weeklies of the whole port tree. But we don't want to push those or consider it a successful build unless a bunch of packages have successfully built. Yeah, you porters know things tend to break from time to time in the port tree. I can't tell you how many times KDE 5 is broken or Chromium or VirtualBox or you know, any other package and we have, everybody has their list of what they consider like, oh my God, I need that. Do not let me upgrade unless that package is present. So that's how we would list it here is we would go through and build that list of essentials and say for a, you know, a ghost BSC desktop, obviously GNOME should build before we try and push this. Yeah, let's see here. This is a special one. We did something a little different for FreeNAS. Uh, FreeNAS developers, most of our guys, their workflow is they want to pack on their laptop and test things and do builds before they push anything public or committed even into Git. So we added a directive called local source where you can have a local directory of all your different GitHub repos checked out and that gets passed through to the Poudreur job at build time. So the way we make that work is in the port itself. So FreeNAS has, oh gosh, 10, 15 different ports that we've, we've created for it. We added a little bit of glue where we can say, you know, if this local source exists that matches the port name, just check it out from that, change the version number, et cetera. Otherwise, you know, fetch it from GitHub from whatever the last known tag was, and that can be bumped the normal way. Okay, ISOs, because again, a lot of us have to build an image at the end of the day. We start off with, you want a nice file name, by default disk1.iso is okay, but eh, you know, I want something a little bit more descriptive of what we actually built. So we'll go ahead and change the file name here. We can set different variables that are expanded when it creates the ISO called a version, maybe a git hash that's supported, date, those are important things. Um, overlay, so installers, most of the ones we've written, when you generate the ISO, a lot of times there's just other stuff you want to throw in there. Maybe something you don't feel like making a package for or didn't come in a, as a package. Could be a post install script or some hooks or conf knob, 
jobs. So we give you the option again using Git, Subversion, Tarball, etc. If you have some sort of overlay uh, file you want to extract or directory you want to throw on the ISO before it gets created, you can do that. We use that for uh, the Plasma build, I'm using that so we can have some post-install scripts that run to detect if you have NVIDIA hardware or Intel and make sure the right packages are loaded and do that logic. But I don't necessarily need that on the system post-install. And then of course ISOs, a lot of times we're you know, conscious of the space being used and we want to keep them as small as possible to save time for our users to download. So we'll have a prune list as well, which follows the same conditionals you'll see. So we can have a default prune list and maybe for TrueNAS we're more aggressive and we want to nuke some other directories as well or leave some other ones. So that gives you an option to slim your ISO down after it's created. Okay. Uh, building the ISO though, you have all these packages, that's great. Do I have to go right in the installer? Well, no, TrueOS ships with a default installer that's fully integrated into this build system. So one of the first things it's able to do is you can give it directives in the JSON that say what packages do you want installed into the ISO. So this is packages actually PKG installed into the ISO before it's generated. So we may have things like you know IPMI tool we want to have on the ISO. Maybe it's a rescue CD and we need to have a bunch of different things available or they're just tools part, used as part of our build process. Um, the Triton desktop's a good example. They do a graphical installer so they'll go through and list XORG and QT and all these different things needed to bootstrap their graphical installer. Uh, dist packages, these are maybe optional things. You just want to make sure the dist files are on the ISO and it's going to go ahead and parse out the origins here and figure out which packages those are and all their dependencies, make sure they end up on your media ready to be installed by your installer. And then last but not least, if you're using the TrueOS installer, you may have a default set of packages you just want always to install. So we give you an option to list that as well. And what's kind of cool is all these are related to one another. So if I go out a package to auto install packages, we'll just say archivers cab extract, why not? That automatically gets injected into the build dependencies for when it does the Poudrier step. So it knows like, oh, the ISO is going to want this package later. We better make sure that did indeed build and was successful and it'll fail out the build early before it gets to the ISO step if that didn't build for some reason. Um, for ISOs as well, um, install scripts. I realize our text-based installer we're using on TrueOS may not be the be-all end-all for some projects and people. Triton's a good example again. They have a graphical installer, so we give them an option via the manifest to say, you know what, skip the text installer, run this other script or thing to launch the graphical installer. That's how they do that. And we also do some unattended installations. You know, IT and others, sometimes you just want to plop it into the build server and walk away and come back and everything's installed. So we give you the option, we use PC sysinstall for TrueOS. You can give it a fully unattended uh, installation script and it'll go ahead and put that on your image and make sure when you boot it, it'll give you a 10 second countdown, like warning everything's going away and then it'll go ahead and do the install. And then lastly is we needed the ability to add uh, post install commands to the installer as well. So where we use that again for Plasma, after the install's done, we're not really done. We've installed what we think you need, but we still want to go through and check and see, oh, you have an NVIDIA card. Great, let me load the driver for you and kind of take care of some of those, those last housekeeping bits before we uh, finish up the installer. We have the ability to run inside the shroot, which is the installed shroot of the system, and then outside. Maybe you have scripts that need to run on the actual ISO because they need to grab comps and do other weird things on the ISO, and then touch the inside of the cheroot. And then the cheroot's passed as an environment variable during the uh, runtime. And then of course, if you're gonna publish packages, I hate having to go and make changes to the FreeBSD base. Again, I wanted everything to be in one manifest as much as possible, so I don't have to try and remember what I've changed. So you can now add the package repo as well and say, here's the repository, here's the key, here's the information I want to be splatted on the installed system at the end and set up and ready to use PKG out of box. Okay, so how do you use it? So we've done this one long JSON manifest, which is cool. What does the build look like? Oh my God, what have you done? Well, it's make build world and make build kernel. It's not super complicated. Again, I didn't want to have to teach people new things. So if you've already used package base, you're already familiar with this, since a lot of people here haven't, maybe this is a new step to you. Um, after make build world build kernel, you'll run make packages. Um, that's gonna do a couple neat things. It's gonna go ahead and start the package base process, which goes through and generates all your you know, kernel, send mail, uh, runtime, etc. 
When that wraps up, before it goes and creates the repo and signs everything, it's going to take a moment, spin up Pudrier internally, build all the ports that you need, all the dependencies, whatever you've told it in the JSON is essential to your image or your appliance. It's going to do all that, take all those, unify them at the end, sign the repo and move on. And then of course at that point the last step is you just go make an image, make an ISO, and you can do that out of the release directory, which this is all pretty similar. If anyone's built FreeBSD, this shouldn't be too uh, surprising. And at the end of the day, you're gonna end up with all the packages here, and you'll end up with your ISO here, assuming you built out a user source. Pretty easy to find. So a couple notes about the packages. So if you've used package base right now, most of you will find that you have a, two repos. You end up with a FreeBSD base repo and you have your port tree repo. That's kind of the one everyone's used to. Uh, we did something a little different here. We decided to take them and merge them all into a single repo. So this is important for a couple reasons. For uh, uh, dependency resolution, yes, you can do it between the two repos, but we have some use cases and we've seen it internally already where we do things like package fetch and then package add. Package adds, adds kind of not as intelligent as packet install and it's not going to de detect uh, dependencies and resolve them because you're installing off of disk. They have to all be in the same directory for that to work. And it turns out when you're pulling from different repos, everything ends up in different directories and all of a sudden you go install package add runtime and it's like, ah, oh, I can't find this dependency you injected, sorry. We just wanted them all in one repo so all the things work properly. Plus it just feels really nice and clean and um, you know, I'm a big fan of that. Um, yeah, that's what I covered there. So what did we touch to do this? How much did you mangle my FreeBSD? Well, surprisingly, not very much. The more we got into this, I was kind of shocked at a few things I did touch. Um, and the top level, the make file, the include one file, we made a few changes to the package creation target where it does the injecting of dependencies into the base packages. We added some targets which do the Pudre run and then combines the resulting packages back into a single right repo for signing at the end. Again, not too intrusive. Um, the biggest thing we added is something called the release.true or dash trueos.sh script. It's a script in the release directory. It's mostly there to do all the Pudrier setup, um, the execution of Pudrier. There's a ton of JSON parsing and logic in there because I'm using JQ for a lot of this. Again, it's shell, and I found using JQ and make files is a little tedious and difficult at times, and that got old, so it made more sense to throw that in a shell script. And also, there's some stuff in there for the ISO directory creation and manipulation where it goes in and adds your overlay, et cetera. It seemed I wanted to keep it separate and drop a new file in rather than going and screwing up uh, FreeBSD's files and having merge conflicts when we pull from upstream. Um, the release make file, we added a new make ISO target, which specifically builds the TrueOS image. It bypasses having to generate dist files. I would love dist files to go away. Yes, I'm one of those guys. As a matter of fact, I did have them go away for a while, and then Martin, I think you complained, and I had to bring them back. They're going away at some point. We'll finally do this, but that, that's the goal here. And you know, it'll save a lot of time, because I'm, I'm very conscious about how long the whole build process takes, because for CI and Jenkins, we want to get that to be as short as possible, because it makes developers happy when they can get a green check mark on it, safe to merge. And then uh, lastly, for the release packages, there's a bunch of UCL files in there. If you've not looked at them before, they're kind of neat. Go take a look. We added a few hard-coded dependencies in there, things that we just kind of felt like were deal breakers everybody's going to need. One of the obvious ones was PKG. I still don't understand why this isn't in base by default or whatever, but we felt like if you're doing a complete package based system, when you do a fresh install, say I'm offline and I can't go fetch and bootstrap package, I still want to be able to use package info, package delete, and actually you manipulate my system regardless on whether I'm online or offline. So we include that as a hard coded dependency. And then we add a JQ, of course, because we have some utilities in our base that depend on that. And then UCL command is used as part of the uh, build process as well. So pretty minimal. We didn't, we didn't force you to bring a lot of stuff in, but those we felt were very reasonable. So our continuous integration, you know, it's 2018. We do a lot of stuff with Jenkins. If, uh, we have a public Jenkins server at IX that handles all free NAS. If you look at it, it's pretty gnarly. There's a lot of different jobs running that do different things. Uh, TrueOS uses it as well. And we decided, you know what? We should have these right in the base repo. It's only a directory and then you throw some files in there. So we did that. 
we added a bunch of nice handy pipelines for you in the Jenkins subdirectory of world that are already predefined and ready to help you build uh, FreeBSD or TrueOS in this case via Jenkins. It means now instead of having to open up a shell and command line, if you have a Jenkins set up, you can just click a button and it's kind of cool. So what does that look like? So in our build setup, um, you'll see a bunch of nicely defined stages that show you what's actually being run, how long each part took, and it's really cool because as we make changes, we want to see those times get shorter and shorter. That disk one's still 21 minutes, Martin, you're killing me. So you gotta get rid of that one at some point. All right, so pipelines by default, the ones we ship anyway, are broken out into the following stages. We'll have a checkout stage, that's where we're you know, getting source from Git or Subversion or whatever you have configured. NullFS, this is kind of a special one, one of our guys, uh, Nick Wolf, I don't know if you're here, but he's responsible for this. We wanted to do reproducible builds of FreeBSD, and Jenkins by default, every time you do a fresh run, it checks things out into a new location, and it turns out the location you build from gets injected into some binaries, and guess what, it's not reproducible anymore, so we wanted to fix that. So we added a NullFS stage that actually takes your Jenkins uh, workspace and then mounts it to a known sane location every single time so you can get reproducible builds. That turned out was important. And then of course, world kernel, no surprises there. The base packages step, which also will build the, the ports packages. Um, we have an ISO generation step, and then there's that darn dist one again. Still want to get rid of that. And then lastly, Jenkins artifacts files at the end, so that's where we take the packages that are built, we ingest them into Jenkins so that we can fetch them via the web interface. And then the very last step, assuming everything else is successful, is we have a published directive. So what's kind of cool is everything's automated. I don't go click buttons really anymore for TrueOS. It just runs on a schedule or when source changes, it kicks off a build and snapshots we do every six hours right now. So you get a world and a bunch of ports ready to go so you can install a builder. And assuming all the steps pass, all the vital packages are built, everything that was uh, requested is successful, it'll go ahead and publish it for us and I don't have to do anything. I just wake up in the morning and do a package upgrade and my life is good. Um, the pipelines, the only things you really have to change to use them is keys you want to sign your repo with. Sorry, you can't have mine. And then publish settings, again, uh, that's our hosting, go get your own. But you change those two things and you can more or less uh, use ours verbatim. Um, once you've modified them, you're welcome to just import them into Jenkins. It's just a couple buttons of a nice web interface to do it. And then boom, you now have a full pipeline and your FreeBSD thing is now building and off and running, you know, automated or as often as you want. Um, now that we're doing this whole weird mangling though, where we're saying ports can now be part of base and they're kind of more or less the same thing, this gives us some neat things to think about. You know, with ports and packages more or less being equal, I mean, there's a lot of things in base I would like to see go away. I know we always love talking about what's coming into base, but I actually get a little more excited because I'm weird about what's coming out because I want to make it slimmer and faster and easier to build. And frankly, the ports tree has some better versions of the same things that are in base. So, a couple candidates, maybe SendMail could go away and you could, you know, bring the ports version in if you really wanted it. SVN Lite, I don't need that, don't use that. If you still do, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, that's one that go away, NTB. We've brought in open NTB or NTB, um, NTBD, for, ah, can't speak, NTPD from ports, that's one as well. SSH, good example. FreeNAS, we don't use the base SSH. We use the portable version from ports because it has the HBN patch and we want to use the NUN cipher for some replication instances. I can now yank that out and just bring in a dependency on the ports version and life goes on. <coughs> this is a controversial one maybe, but Clang, have you guys done Build World recently? Is it pleasant? I mean, so we did, we're experimenting with this. Me and Martin are arguing about it still, but we've, we've experimented taking Clang out of base and on some of our builders, we're down to like eight minutes for a build world now. Like, it's fantastic. Like, this is, <laughs> this is what I want. We can use an external uh, compiler. This is great. Again, we want to do pull request builds. Our developers need that. And the sooner I can give them, hey, your pull request started and then there's a green checkbox that you can merge, that's amazing. So if I can knock 35 or more minutes off the build, that's a huge one right there. So that's something we're actually working on. I've got some patches. We're actually testing that out. I'll talk about that in a moment. But we wrote something um, called a compiler bootstrap command in TrueOS where you can indeed take Clang out and then you can run this command and it'll bootstrap your ports version. So it could be LLVM 6.0 or 7.0. 
If you want to use GCC, I don't see why we couldn't add support for that. It just hasn't been something I really need at the moment, so I haven't done it. Um, and then bonus, because we're doing package based, a lot of tools that um, you use on FreeBSD, so a good example, IO Cage, Pudrer itself, a lot of those things don't really speak package based yet. They're still relying on those annoying dist files. So we added a, a shell script which will go ahead and bootstrap a jail for you, or a shroud, if you will, and a couple different types. You can tell it it's a Pudrer jail, and that will actually take it and load it into Pudrer for you. You don't have to know anything or do any magic, it just does it. It can even bootstrap a, a ports compiler for you as well that can be used for Pudrer. Or it can just make a plain old everyday standard vanilla jail as well. So that's kind of helpful to have. So what do we still want to do? Well, these projects never seem to end. There's always more. So there is a little wish list I have here. So additional ISO customization options. As of about a week, week and a half ago, I got FreeNAS now successfully building. If you go look in our repo, we have this beautiful FreeNAS manifest. It's JSON. It's all alphabetized. It just really makes me geek out because it's so clean and pretty. We can now build and get a FreeNAS image based on 12 using this method. But where we have to, what we have to solve next is the installer. You know, the TrueOS installers need it's more of a traditional FreeBSD installer you know add your root password add your users do you want SSH on etc that's great but that's not suitable for FreeNAS so what I would like to do is uh, go and try and customize the TrueOS installer and make that itself modular so that in the JSON file you can add logic new dialogues like I'd like that all to be represented in the JSON file so you can say here's the install phases I want to ask for here's the things I want to prompt what I want to do etc and I'd like to mimic basically what the free has installer does. It's going to be interesting, might be tough, we'll see, but I'll be hacking on that probably over the next couple months. Um, base package sets for hosts and jails. So FreeBSD's base packages are broken up into some, I guess, families if you will. You'll have runtime, you might have a bunch of development packages, you'll have debug, there's some profile ones. You know, I've talked to Brad about this a little bit. I'd like to have a, cl a clearer way to define groups of packages as well. I don't necessarily want to do a meta package. We're still kind of talking about what this should look like. But for FreeNAS, for example, we want a little bit more minimal image. We don't need all of FreeBSD under the hood. We want to save some space. Maybe there's things that are too dangerous for users we don't want to put there. So we'd like to find some way to more clearly define that, maybe have that even be in the JSON file and say this is kind of my base image set. And then uh, if we do end up pursuing the removing Clang out of base, which I hope we can get to, maybe some settings in Etsy that let you control that, you know, which version of the ports uh, compiler you're using. And then last but not least, right now we build ISOs, which are hybrid USB images. That's great. I'd like to integrate it into the build VM targets as well. And uh, Joe Maloney, who's not here, one, our QA manager at IX, actually just showed me he did a live CD build target as well, which is kind of cool and can use the manifest and will build you a, a live rescue image, which is pretty slick. So I'd like to get that integrated as well. So before I end, a very special thank you to a few people who've suffered with me through much of this process. Martin, you gotta be first because yeah, I think I've broken you quite a few times, I'm sorry, but it's been a process. Joe Maloney at IX, our QA manager, he's helped out quite a bit with this. Uh, Ken Moore, my brother who works on Project Trident, he's using this for an IX internal project and also Project Trident, so he's given me a lot of good feedback. And so has Eric Turgeon, who's the uh, Ghost BSD maintainer, so he's moved over to this. And it's been great to have feedback from kind of all these disparate groups to see if we could come up with one thing that just worked for everyone. So far, so good. So apologies for all the bumps along the way. And then last but not least, uh, everything's up on GitHub. So TrueOS, TrueOS is just a fork. I call it a downstream fork of the FreeBSD repo that has this build system integrated into it. And then you can actually take a look at the default manifest there if you'd like. There's a release uh, manifest directory that has like a FreeNAS manifest, has a Plasma manifest and some others. So you can see examples of how we've taken this and like really built widely different, uh, very wildly different images using the same uh, system. So with that, I think that's my last slide. So any questions? Oh, you're going to the mic? Okay. So So the I bet you didn't think you'd get a JSON test. talk at a FreeBSD, MeBSD conference. Right. So the weird. question I have is, uh, have you th thought about integrating the tests into it so that as part of your CI pipeline, the tests sure. at 
The Please. question, well, I don't need to repeat it. I guess yeah. those are recorded. So um, yes, it's something we like, would like to do. It's not done today, but I would imagine in 2019, we'll be adding the tests to part of the default pipeline. Cause I know we're doing, you know, Alexander Moten and the OS guys have done some ZFS things. We'd like to get that integrated at some point. So by all means, I expect those are gonna show up, so. Does that incorporate FreeBSD update or another updater? Should you build an update and want okay. to push it out to systems? So FreeBSD update, no, because FreeBSD update is the older school way. It doesn't have a concept of package base. Um, TrueOS, we ship an updater called TrueOS update, which expects you to be on ZFS. It does boot environments for updates and it handles all the package downloading and upgrading your boot environment and all that. So we ship that with TrueOS. You're welcome to use that. If you're a little bit more uh, savvy at the command line, there's no reason you can't just go do package upgrade yourself. That's more than fine. But for our users and for kind of our use case, we wanted something that was more automated. So TrueOS update basically handles all that for you. It, the way it works is it downloads all the packages with package fetch. So you can have an online phase and then you can even you know, unplug your laptop or you know, lose connection and it can still update. It'll then reboot, it'll create a new boot environment, update all the packages in it, reboot into it, et cetera, and you're ready to go. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, well thank you very much, appreciate it.